You're listening to the Better Angels Podcast. I'm John Wood Jr. And I'm Greg Steinbrecher. What's going on, Greg? How you doing, John? Wait a second. You're not Kieran O'Connor. I'm not? You're not. Oh, Kieran is out with a uh, with, uh, headache or so. I don't know what's... what's uh... What's going on? Okay. Poor he's, guy. He's at home. He couldn't make it. He couldn't make it today. But well, his loss is my gain. And right. um, fortunately, Kieran and I agree on everything. So not a beat will be missed. Not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. But that's okay because we're speaking to somebody. Uh, we just spoke to somebody today, actually, who's a lot smarter than either of us. Miss Monica Guzman, uh, who is a, I believe, a co-founder of the Evergrey in Seattle, Washington. She's a wonderful journalist. She is a wonderful thinker. And we had an incredible conversation today about uh, having conversations across the the identity divide, right? So talking about race, identity, politics, and the difficulty people have empathizing across those lines. And uh, Greg, I thought it was powerful. I thought it was an incredible conversation. She, like you said, just brings this really unique perspective that just like makes you feel good to be like living in this world and talking to people. I guess you met her at the weave project and and you came back singing her praises. And after this conversation, I can totally understand uh, why you were so taken by her because she really is uh, a truly uh, unique and and, and awesome voice. Yeah, totally. Well, we won't spoil it, uh, but let's go ahead and uh, jump into it for the audience. So ladies and gentlemen, we give you Miss Monica Guzman. Monica, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How's it going? Not too bad. Not too bad. And I'm totally stoked to get the chance to talk to you after, uh, I guess it hasn't been that long since we met, but so much happens in so short a time these days that, uh, you know, it feels like the world has spun a couple of, you know, it's just gone around the sun a couple of times since then. Yeah. Absolutely. We've, I mean, we were talking a bit before the episode started rolling. Mm. Uh, We've was such an illuminating congregation of people you know, <laughs> yeah. who who have this desire to connect uh but have some different ideas about how to go about it mm-hmm. and sometimes those really clashed in interesting ways yeah definitely and just so just for anybody who is not familiar with the reference so the weave the social fabric project is an initiative of the aspen institute that was that is run and directed by uh, david brooks uh, who folks will know obviously columnist from the new york times which basically is seeking to bring together people who are building a culture of community, doing things on a grassroots level and beyond across America into sort of a sort of something of a cultural movement. And so what the conference was about was basically figuring out how to take the values of understanding and empathy and collaboration that each of these people embody in their own local communities and to figure out how we can sort of scale that up uh, nationally. Um, in part. But like you said, Monica, uh, people came into that with some very different opinions about what it is folks ought to be uh, focused on. And there was so much racial and class and political diversity that, you know, presented some uh, some predictable, uh, uh, I guess, hurdles to jump, you know, in terms of accomplishing that. So um, and it it was the the whole thing was a fabulous uh, thing to think to participate in. A lot of good was done. But I did want to talk to you a little bit I wanted us to talk a little bit about kind of what it takes to have uh, conversations that work across some of these divides and in our own personal experiences. And before we uh, jump into the back and forth, I wanted to read a a couple of passages from a book that's just come out uh, called Impossible Conversations. And it's by a friend of mine, uh, Mr. Peter, Peter Bogosian. Uh, and an uh, individual named James Lindsay, uh, who's a mathematician. Uh, Peter is a professor of, I think, philosophy and ethics at Portland State University. And he's sort of <laughs> sort of controversial, sort of well-known for the academics hoax paper scandal. I won't get into that too much here. Uh, but there's a line in the early part of the book, which I highly recommend for folks. Uh, but there's a line in the early part of the books where he defines impossible conversations. And he says, when we say impossible conversations, We mean conversations that feel futile because they take place across a seemingly unbridgeable gulf of disagreement in ideas, beliefs, morals, politics, or worldviews, right? So those are the types of conversations he's saying are impossible, but the book is about how you have those conversations anyway. And they're not really impossible, but the way we go about them tends to make them impossible. And he actually, interestingly enough, he gives a real-life example of a conversation he had with a colleague 
that is the is an example of the type of conversation you don't want to have, right? So the title of this section uh, is called uh, "Conversing with an Asshole." And <laughs> spoiler <laughs> spoiler alert: Peter himself is the asshole in the conversation. Um, but uh, yeah, so the the the, the uh, woman he's talking to is a woman who uh, with the initials SDL. So they're talking about affirmative action. I'll just read it from the top. He says, "Nearly two decades ago, one of this book's authors, Peter." was discussing affirmative action with a colleague, SDL, a white female who described herself as liberal. As conversations about controversial topics tend to do, it quickly became heated. Then, as par for the course in these situations, before long, it went downhill fast. Let's take a look back. SDL, you keep denying that if affirmative action is... You keep denying that uh, affirmative action is fair. Bogosian, yeah, that's because it's not. Who's it fair to? STL, I told you already. Traditionally marginalized groups like African Americans, they're coming from a deficit. They didn't have the same opportunities that you and I had. Bogosian. But why does that require manufacturing outcomes? SDL. You sound like a broken record because they're Americans and they deserve better. You don't understand because you've never had those struggles. You've gone to good schools and never dealt with even a fraction of what they deal with on a daily basis. Bogosian. Let's say you're right. I don't think you are. But let's say you are. What evidence do you have that affirmative action is a way to remedy past injustices? SDL. I don't have any evidence. It's the right thing to do because Bogosian. So you have no evidence. You have complete confidence in a belief for which you have no evidence. SDL. You're not listening. Peter. I am listening. I'm trying to figure out how you could believe so strongly in something with no evidence. Do you think African Americans are better off with Clarence Thomas? Do you think it was a good thing that he's a Supreme Court justice? Or would African Americans be better off with a white liberal male? SDL, you're effing annoying. Seriously. I can't believe you're a teacher. Bogosian, I'm sorry you feel that way. Maybe if you could better defend your beliefs, you wouldn't be so annoyed with someone who's asking you softball questions. <laughs> SDL, what do you teach your students? Bogosian, you're not my student and don't get so upset. SDL, you're an asshole. We're done. <laughs> And so, so he, so Peter recounts this uh, conversation up in, uh, in the early part of the book, and it, it, he and James go on to write that Peter was the one who was in fact being an asshole in the conversation, because Peter was not was not listening. I mean, what what he? Well, I'll just read the following paragraph. Uh, she was right. Peter wasn't listening. He was annoying, and he was being an asshole. In this brief exchange. He interrupted, used but in response to her statements, probably the least wrong thing he did, shifted topics, and didn't answer her questions. He was so focused on winning, and even intellectually embarrassing her, that he ruined the conversation and closed the door to productive future exchanges. SDL walked out on the conversation, but she should have walked away sooner. So that's that passage. What strikes me about that is that if that conversation had happened on Twitter, all of his kind of comebacks and assholery would have been positively <laughs> reinforced by a lot of people like posting gifts and like oh owned and dunked on and all this stuff like yeah right you know that's that's a good point it winds up becoming positive fodder on social media so my question for you monica i would ask this question of greg but the answer is going to be obviously yes on his end so there's no need but have you ever been an asshole in a conversation monica <laughs> have you oh, uh... of <laughs> of course. Oh, all the time. I mean, this is this is human. The easiest mm -hmm. thing is to be the asshole. You know, right. it, it, mm -hmm. it, so far as he defines asshole in that example, the mm -hmm. easiest thing is to feel like you have a stake in the game that you have to defend, that the easiest mm -hmm. thing is to not tolerate challenges to your ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, the easiest thing is to not be curious because who cares? You're already right. The easiest thing is to believe you're right. Right. Um, but I like what is that saying? Um, Listen, argue as if you're right. Listen as if you're wrong. Mm -hmm. right. um, I've always really liked that because we're all wrong a lot of the time. It's just whether we know it or not. Mm -hmm. Plus, there is really no right and wrong when it comes to society. It's just where enough consensus and movement builds to actually result in laws or some kind of change or culture shift, right? Mm -hmm. um, who gets to decide? We don't have like some omnipotent being that gets to say, no, you're right, you're wrong. There's not really that thing. Mm -hmm. So it's really all up to us, which means, yeah, you got to stay humble. You got to stay curious. And it's going to be hard work. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I think that you made the point that it's there's no final arbiter, right, of who's right and wrong in a given conversation. You might say that one person has more facts than the other. You might want to go to Google and fact check the other person and so forth. But it's like the only referee we have in our conversations that keeps them on track is our own willingness 
to engage from a place of good faith, I think. But it gets uh, it gets sort of difficult, I think, um, for a lot of reasons. But one reason is because our identities get so worked in to the conversations that it gets, oh, yeah. yeah, it gets it gets tough to have an issue about like they were talking about affirmative action. Neither person in that conversation is an Af- is African American, but it becomes sort of like this moral question where it's like, well, if I want to be on the side of oppressed people, I have to obviously support the kinds of policies that are that are, you know, at least meant to be beneficial to them, right? And uh, then you have people who say, well, no, I'm empirical. I'm based in facts and logic and so forth. And, you know, you have this kind of conversation happen where people are talking past each other and just the just the way they do. But yep. if But if you are a person who I think, whether you identifying just as a politically, as a Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative, or if your identity is as an African American, as a woman, as a gay person, as a transgender person, so forth. I think that it, 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 part of what we're struggling with as a society is to come up with or to recognize some set of rules that feel like they're uniform from conversation to conversation. Yeah. Um, and um, that's part of what I think we saw at Weave a little bit was sort of like people having different conversational frameworks for the types of topics they wanted wanted to engage. So I'm just yeah. wondering, in, 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 in your life, has that dynamic showed up a little bit in in your work? First of all, tell us a little bit about your background and kind of like, you know, how that how that led you into an interest in news and politics, et cetera. Yeah, I am. Um, so I, I am a journalist. I've been a journalist my whole career. I'm the founder of something called the Evergrey co-founder right. and it's been around three years. And it's a publication in Seattle that is uh, very much based on participation with the public and taking cues from our audience and just collaborating in all the ways we can answering reader questions. We do in-person events. We care uh, a lot about helping people add meaning to their lives locally and making connections and relationships, not just about informing them. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Evergrey has, from the very beginning, worked really hard to try to set the table for a lot of different perspectives mm-hmm. from the point of view that that makes for a healthier society. Right. I mean, to the to the things you were talking about, um, I think often what happens today, because we're living in a time that's like everyone's afraid and anxious for a lot of valid reasons, is when people are pretending to be talking about ideas, they're really combating identities. They're really mm-hmm. like seeing those clash. When somebody asks, wait, what's your politics? What they're really asking is, are you on my team? <laughs> um, this is a time when belonging yeah. matters a lot. And, um, mm-hmm. and oftentimes people feel more safe mm-hmm. if they are, um, if they are like defending and, and really rooting themselves in some kind of community or identity or something. Mm. And any idea that can challenge that thing they feel they belong to, it's sort of better to do whatever it takes, rationalize away the challenging idea. Mm. But as long as you can keep that identity that, that feels so important to you in this very scary time, you know? Yeah. Um, and it comes down to just basic human nature about fear. Yeah. Like if you're afraid, you need security mm. more than usual. Right. Um, and so we we kind of we resolve to, to to those things and and we just use the language of still talking about ideas, but we're not really we're not really being curious about the idea. We're not externalizing it and and treating it as something impersonal. We're actually making about making it as personal as it could possibly be. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. No, I think that that's totally uh, accurate. Uh, I, yeah. Look, I'm 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 an African American. I'm mixed race African American, right? So I'm half black, half white. And it's funny because I'm sort of conscious of the fact that when I walk into a room, there can be, <laughs> if, especially if I walk into a room full of white people, Greg. Um, I'm sorry, man. I just, <laughs> no, no, no. It's white, okay. As the, as the full <laughs> no. white guy at the, at the table here. Like, I can be no, I'm the one feeling uncomfortable. Yeah, right. There you go. I can be conscious of the fact that if I walk into a room full of white people who, who don't know me, sometimes it could seem as if, like, there's a little bit of a question of, like, okay, what kind of jokes might we be allowed to tell or whatnot? You know, like what subjects or topics should we treat with, with kid gloves, you know, given the fact that, you know, there's a, there's a new dynamic that just kind of introduced itself. I was hanging out with, uh, I went and visited Kieran, uh, speaking of white guys, uh, and, <laughs> and a, like a poetry slam that he had uh, a while back. And there was a black dude who was in the room who like, uh, Oh yeah, you didn't get the invite for that, Greg. We'll get you to the, we'll get you the next one. Yeah, Kieran, he's the, he does poetry jams. Oh man, who knew? All right, yeah, right. He's, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. 
Um, and uh, <laughs> but there's another black guy in the room. Most of the people there are white, uh, although this is mixed, you know. And uh, and I, I don't know this guy, uh, but I'm like, hey man, what's going on? And he slaps my hand. And he's like, man, he's just like another. He's just what do you say? He's like another day being black in America, brother. The struggle continues. <laughs> and I'm, <laughs> Okay. There's two black guys talking to each other, but I'm just kinda like, ah, John, dude, really? You know? But the thing is is and he was being funny and uh, it yeah. didn't didn't bother me or anything really. But it sets a certain tone for other folks around. And so the thing that I think a lot of white people feel, which is interesting, is that on the one hand I feel like white people are split. Greg, you can speak for white America in a second here. Yeah, absolutely. But on the <laughs> I feel like white people are split to where some white folks feel, and there's particularly white people on the left that they got to bend over backwards to be sensitive to the experiences that other people have had in a way that makes space for other people uh, to speak. And and I don't think that's necessarily, I don't think that's come from a bad place at all. Uh, Then you think you've got, you know, not just white people, but certainly a lot of white folks who feel that there's imbalance to that, right? Like we're giving, we're privileging identity in a way that makes it hard to have a reasonable sort of conversation and so greg speaking for white america i'm wondering if that (laughs) dynamic resonates with uh, anything you've observed sure uh yeah i'll speak for the uh monolithic uh (laughs) paradigm of white america here um you know i think gosh i think a few things i think one because right now and i actually just um Quick plug, wrote an article speaking to this dynamic a little bit on the Better Angels website that I think will be released soon. But I think, you know, we obviously have a history in this country of racism and and it which, you know, it continues to this day. And I think that term racism carries for for good reason a a um, a potent um yeah, God, what's the word? Uh, pejorative uh, mm-hmm. connotation. Obviously, I mean, like, it's one of the worst things, you know, you could be figuratively uh, tarred and feathered with. But right now, I think we we live in an age where if you say something insensitive or, mm-hmm. or if you criticize, you know, a, a person's belief, um, especially in a way that might be somewhat ignorant or ill-conceived, you get the word uh racism thrown at you and obviously people people for very good reason don't want don't want that mark on them and so come into conversations a little bit uh a a little bit not able to speak their full their minds as completely as they might otherwise be able to if that Mm. if that consideration weren't in the room Secondly, you know, I think I I, I was going to ask you guys. It's tough being white, man. <laughs> no, that's, I, mean, that's like, I know. I feel so many people rolling their eyes right now. <laughs> um, and it's like, obviously, like, if you don't want to get tired with that, like, don't say racist things. But I just think that <laughs> definition of racist thing has started to expand a little bit where I hear it. Um, I hear it all the time amongst white people, like observing actions. And they go, oh, that's so racist. And it's like, well, maybe it was insensitive. Maybe it was n- not considerate. But but racist, I I don't know. And I, and the, the second thing is, is that I think, and the example I'm thinking of right now is arguments and conversations and that begin with somebody saying like, as a blank, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of, that's that's credibility, right? Yes, exactly. That's where I was going to go. Yeah. It's supposed Mm -hmm. to establish credibility. Right. Uh, And by establishing credibility, Perhaps knocking down a peg or two, the credibility of the person uh, with whom one is speaking. Mm, right. Um, mm. And I'm curious as to what you guys think of those as a uh, conversations, because on one hand, it's true. Everyone has different experiences. Um, and everyone brings something different to the conversation. At the same time, it it establishes that you are now not quite debating the ideas so much, but the person who is speaking those ideas, at least my, by my lights, but I'm curious as to what you guys think of that. Mm. Yeah. It's a signal. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a set of signals that we feel we're supposed to put out there because identity is now so important. Um, there's, right. there's lots of situations where it feels like, yeah, if you don't share the identity of a certain group, you cannot really comment about anything around that group or speak to anything that that group experiences. Mm. And that comes from a good place. I mean, I think about, again, basic human nature thing. We all want to feel heard, right? 
And there's been a lot of groups in America that have not been heard for a very long time in ways that like have affected how we live, how we coexist, everything about how we we understand who we are. Mm -hmm. And so to come to try to solve that, to try to come out of that or to be in a place of like suddenly we're way more aware of that, you know, is hard. It takes work. And so there's something really nice about as a blank. Because it kind of establishes that, yeah, we, we do come from different places and we have different experiences. And you can say that as a Latina, right, Monica? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's right. I, I forgot to mention I am, I am Latina. I'm white Hispanic. I'm, you know, who knows? There's a bunch of different. Right. Latinx is, still feels weird to me because. I was going to yeah. ask you about that a l- little bit later. Wait, is it Latinx or is it Latinx? Let, I've heard Latinx. I've heard I don't both. know. Okay. Um, I was just in Mexico for a month visiting my family. Like nobody there is using it. No one in my family is using it. <laughs> yeah. It's. It feels it's a it's a term that is you know trying to yeah let's let's actually jump back to that in, anyway, in, in sorry, a minute we can get there yeah, later yeah, yeah, yeah like, we'll, get, we'll get to that yeah 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 uh, mm-hmm. where were we well where on cre- on credibility so you you yeah. you know yeah you introduce your your label and so forth and it's a way of um uh it's it's a way of kind of establishing what you have a right to say I guess and or at least what you have credibility to say in a conversation you were talking about how we're coming out of this history of social inequity and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And so it just makes sense that, you know, now we're trying to figure out how to finally listen. Right. Um, and how to make sure that groups that have not been heard mm-hmm. very much at all, that we actually are making room for right. them. And then I think there's a there's a pretty wide spectrum mm-hmm. um, for different people about what that means. I think right. for some people, making room for those voices means everyone else shuts up <laughs> every single day right. get out of the way you have yeah. nothing to say here and furthermore i think i think like another place that would like the far end of that spectrum is also they do not ask me questions mm-hmm. about my experience i am not here to educate you that adds emotional labor onto mm-hmm. me and that's not fair right. so i guess you're either educated or you're not and mm-hmm. if you're not you suck mm-hmm. right so that's that one far far place sure and and yeah, and then I think there's like the other extreme that says, let's just be blind to all our differences. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't work either because it, you can't you can't have people feel unheard or unseen, right? Mm. So now that we're talking about, we're digging up all this history, we're kind of flattening the timeline a little bit and thinking about the sins of the past in a very vivid way. Mm. You can't then hope to unsee or just kumbaya it all, all away. Mm. Right, so yeah. we're trying to find the sweet spot. Mm. Between like acknowledging the rejection, the the ignorance, the bias, the mistreatment, the injustices, and and somehow compensating for that, while also addressing common humanity and allowing people to stay curious, stay uninformed, but be able to connect, mm. uh, and that's really really hard. That's a, that's a tricky you know line to try to navigate. Yeah, it is really hard, and you know it's. I, I feel like I. Um... First of all, the way you the way you put it, trying to find the sweet spot, right? Or on the on the one hand, we're able to open room for the conversation, but on the other hand, we're able to speak to each other in a way that may acknowledge the you know the difference in I guess sort of in background where different people are coming to conversations from, and yeah. managing that. You know, it it is um, that's a it's a it's a really tough thing. I. I guess I'm a person who just just real quick. I mean, I'm yeah. I, I'm one of those people who has tended to kind of like be put off by what some folks call political correctness and so forth, because I tend to like to think that look, let's just have a conversation based off of the merits of the ideas in front of us and kind of you know leave the labels out of it and so forth. But on the other hand, I'm very sensitive to the fact that you know look, people really do have experiences that are strikingly different and just on the level of being a decent human being you know every conversation i have with every take race out of it for a second take even politics out of it for a second you know if i'm talking to you about anything i mean you know i'll come up with an absurd example let's say we're talking about baseball or something like that and if i'm talking to you know let's just say i'm talking to somebody who's like you know who's who's dead I died because he got hit by a foul ball at a baseball game. I'm, you know, probably not right for me to linger too much on like, you know, how great a time I had at the, uh, you know, at the Dodger <laughs> game last week or something like that. It's a ridiculous example, but you know, the, but the larger, the larger point is just that, you know, I can understand even if I, you know, have a difference of feeling about it, 
why it is that, say, Colin Kaepernick would want to take a knee, you know, at, at the national anthem at a football game. It's not something you're going to see me doing, and I would be interested in having a conversation with him in terms of like why would we feel why we might feel differently about it. But you know, Kaepernick and other people look at the flag as kind of representing this this institution of the United States of America that they feel has not adequately engaged the reality of of racial inequality and even oppression and persecution and so forth. So if I'm talking to somebody who has that feeling, I could try and engage them in a tit for tat sort of debate about the facts of the matter. But, you know, it's probably worth it for me to try and convey some sensitivity in the context of of saying, look, you and I have a difference of opinion on on how to how to go about uh, on how we feel about the flag. Right. And I really want to tell you sort of like, you know, how this issue makes me feel. But I should be able to recognize the feelings of a person who has a very different American experience than I do, you know, because yeah. uh, mm-hmm. even within the African-American community, no, not all black people have the same experiences, obviously. And I think within, you know, the the Latino or Latino, Latinx community see now I'm tripping over it um, <laughs> within the Asian community, within the gay community, within the trans community, you know, there's there's all sorts of variety and and, and whatnot. And so. For me, finding that balance has been a bit of a has been a um, an ongoing project, and I feel like I'm pretty good at it because I was raised with so many different cultural and racial identities. And so I'm wondering, uh, Monica, in, in your case, real quick, um, as a I mean, just sort of I guess going back to your background and so forth. As a Latina, as yes. a Latina, see, I didn't want to, I didn't want to say it a second time, but. Um, do you, do you feel like there's certain sort of like political or social expectations that people put on you when you walk into a conversation, you know, do you, oh, sure. do you get the sense that people feel like they got to be sensitive in this way or oh, they, I see, yeah. um, a little bit. Yeah, a little bit, but I think I share something with you, John, in that like my background and my identities, I, I have multiple ones. And I right. think there's something about when you, when you feel like you have a foot in, in different sides of things in different communities, it's a lot harder to feel extremely rooted in one of your identities. Yeah, right, right. right. So, so yeah. So with, um, with being a Latina, the way that I am a Latina is very different than the way a lot of other folks are Latino, right? Like mm. I moved to the States when I was six mm. and, um, you know, went to American schools in rural New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Uh, I still speak Spanish. My kids are bilingual. Like that's cool. We just spent, you know, a month with my family back in Mexico. Um, I did not cross over illegally. Mm -hmm. Um, My dad worked for um, like was a computer programmer and got Mm -hmm. transferred to Texas. So we got in line, we did the green card, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, But one way that I, that I straddle different worlds that I come, I come back to a lot for myself and I wanted to to share this so that it was kind of known is um, so my parents are Mexican immigrants. They are the ones that brought me over right when I was six and, and we, they became citizens, uh, I think, when I was like 16 or 15. And so I became automatically a citizen. And, um, and as soon as they were citizens, they were Republicans. <laughs> and then, yeah, and as soon as, you know, when, when Trump was on the ticket, they voted for him and they mm. still support him. Yeah. And one of the neatest party tricks in Seattle for me mm. is to bring up in a group of people in Seattle that my parents are Mexican immigrants who voted for Trump. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> And the next thing I say is how I see them every weekend and they're my best friends mm-hmm. and how I've had endless conversations with them and how if I were them, I would have voted for Trump too. That's a real, that's a real, like that stops the conversation. It's, yeah. And and then Dude, heads, you, heads just explode. Yeah. Everywhere. People have to reboot a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but like, but it's true. I can say that a hundred percent. Now, if you, if you, if you don't mind me asking, why did, um, how, how would your parents explain their, uh, their, their vote. How would they explain their uh, support yeah, of I mean, President to, Trump? To sum it up, you know, and, and recognizing they're not in the room, and so there's no way I can. Sure, sure, sure. Right. As well as I can. Um, my mother uh, was when I was in high school. She was an abstinence ca- counselor, but more like a like a pro life activist. Mm-hmm. Um, she took. Uh, I went to Catholic high school. You know, or Mexican Catholic, uh, mm-hmm. or I grew up Mexican Catholic. I'm not anymore. But she would take groups of students down to D.C. for the March for Life. Um, mm-hmm. Abortion to her, it it absolutely is murder to my right, mother. Right. So voting for anyone who is good with abortion being legal is akin to voting for murder. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, 
you know, that, that's a, she's a single issue voter in some ways, but, but not really. Like she also has a whole lot of other reasons why, why, why she supports Trump um, and, and voted that way. My dad, um, it's interesting. Like he brought, so, so you have to understand something about my dad. Like he, he grew up in Mexico. Mexico is, uh, you know, a little corrupt sometimes mm. as, as I'm sure y'all know, like yeah. there's, there's a, there's bigger messes there than here by far. Mm. Um, and it's just, it's, it's too bad. And it's very like accepted in that society. Yeah. My dad grew up with, with his dad, my grandfather, inc- like a really noble guy who it really mattered to him to never cheat, mm. to always pay his taxes. Um, there's ways in Mexico where you can bribe a police officer. You know, if you want to, there's ways you can just cheat. Um, mm. And my grandfather never did. And my father grew up thinking that was pretty awesome. Yeah. And so he looked around his society and he's like, Mexico is a place that doesn't enforce its laws. It doesn't respect its laws. Mm. But the United States, there's a place that respects its laws. Mm. Right. Mm. He gets in line. He crosses the border. He comes into this country. And he has very little, very little identification with folks who do not respect the laws when it yeah. comes to immigration. And he believes that this is a place. So the law and order thing mm. is really important to him. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, makes perfect sense. Yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, and there's also like, I've talked to him a lot about, he also just, you know, let's throw a grenade in the, on the government. Mm-hmm. Trump is unpredictable. Well, cool. Let, let's see what happens because, <laughs> the government sucks. you know, like everything's right. broken. Boom. Let's see what happens. It can't possibly be worse than what's already here. Right. Hmm. Yeah. 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 No, that, um, that, that makes sense. And yet it is a, it almost sounds impossible on the basis of the labels, right? On the right, basis of, right. you know, your parents being Mexican immigrants and so forth. Well, by definition, you know, they must. Well, that, and that's one it. of the, that, I, I gotta say, like, that is very irritating. Like, I understand it. But, but in, in America, we have a way of thinking if someone's Latino or Mexican, they can only be one thing. Hmm. It's like Mexico is as diverse a culture as here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm, you know, if you look at me, I'm, I can pass for white. I know that I can. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of Mexicans who can't. And right. so race is its own thing, right? And how we identify across class and the divisions, it's just a whole other can of worms. Mm-hmm. But from here, what's interesting to me is like, when I'm in Mexico, I'm very clearly white. Mm-hmm. Like, there's no question. Mm-hmm. I come in here, I'm a person of color. Yeah. <laughs> when I cross, when I'm That's in the United thing. States, I'm a yeah. person of color, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, there's a lot more complexity and nuance to race and ethnic identity and all of that, that we usually, then there's usually time or room well, to make more because we're too, we need to be fighting these battles and there's no time to parse apart little nuances. Like yeah. That. Right. Yeah. The individuality of people's experiences and stories gets lost in the necessity of the broader social struggle. I mean, I have these sorts of conversations, Greg, you're getting a whole lot of education right now in terms of the shades, no pun intended, <laughs> actually pun intended. Of these various, you know, people of color experiences, but I'm, I'm black, but I'm a lighter skinned black guy, right? So that kind of like, even I have conversations with my wife and so forth. Well, we'll talk about the black experience, and she'll talk to me about having been followed around in, you know, department stores and so forth by store managers who thought that she might be about to steal something, while her white friend was actually stealing things in like the corner of the, <laughs> you know, yeah, like yeah. The wait, was your wife intentionally a decoy or was <laughs> no, no? Okay. But I guess she, but according to her, her her white friend was savvy enough to know that that was her opportunity, okay, <laughs> something like that, and you know, and, and I'll be like, you know, my experiences. It's not that I have not, I think, had some instances of being profiled. I mean, I've I've been messed with by the police, you know, here or there over the years. And was it racial? Was it just bad cop? I I I could go into details about it. I think that there was elements of both potentially, in, in some of the stories I would tell. But you know, I I don't have all the stories my wife has to tell. And you know, she's quick to point out to me. She'll say, "Yeah, but you're light skinned." <laughs> you, know, you get the. You know, I, I've, I've gotten the same kind of thing. There was a uh, a trip in college our freshman year that we took. Um, and again, I'd grown up, grown up in rural New Hampshire, surrounded by white people. Like, mm. that was just my existence. Um, and I went to this trip uh, at college where it was all basically the people of color, like, going on a retreat, right? And it was one of my first exposures to, oh, yeah, there's a whole there's a whole conversation here I haven't really been a part of. Mm. And, and I remember one one person who was Mexican spoke with a thick accent didn't know Spanish, but mm. grew up along the border. Right. Told me, you're not really Mexican. You're not Mexican enough. Mm. 
Right. I remember how that like stuck with me. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, you, you had asked like, you know, am I ever treated differently? You know, do I feel like people treat me differently when I come into the room? Cause I'm Latina. I'll tell you this, and this is, in, I've never really heard others articulate this. So hmm. I feel in Seattle. So Seattle is a very, very blue progressive city, right? Right, right now, Seattle is very interested in correcting these injustices, mm-hmm. right? right? In every way that, way that we can. I think Seattle's a little insecure about the fact that it's still a majority white city. It's like, we'd really rather not be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, we, we want to the world and we want to reflect all the good stuff. Great, but, but great. You, Remember I was saying on Twitter about Portland. Portland is great. I love Portland. I haven't been in Seattle yet. I, I'm told by smart people that Seattle is better than Portland. Um, uh, yep, you, you were told by me. Yes, yes. Right. <laughs> By Miss Guzman here, so send your hate mail to Monica if you're a Port- Portlander. But I said I said on Twitter something like Portland is great. It's a city with more Black Lives Matter signs and posters than it has actual black people. <laughs> that was a good- yeah. Is Seattle the city where they uh, uh, closed a like taco shop because the owners were white and it was cultural appropriation, or was that oh. Portland? I don't remember that. I do okay. remember that story. I don't remember where. But anyway, Monica, so Seattle is seeking to remedy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I, what I was going to tell you, which is, which is kind of unusual to say out loud, I'm just going to do it, is this. Um, I feel like in, the, in this city that is very progressive, um, I kind of get the best of both worlds mm. in the following way. Right. I, I am a person of color in a way that if you put me on your panel, you can feel good about your race, the racial makeup of your panel. You, <laughs> You get, the, you get the optics you get the optics out of the way you know what i mean yeah but but also i can tell you that like one of the only um discriminations i think i've actually suffered like it really just comes from my name because i look white mm. so when people see my name like i used to write a column in the seattle newspaper and sometimes you know people just say go back to mexico and all that mm-hmm. stuff right. my name is it was right but like yeah it often it often feels like i, I kind of get the best of both worlds like I don't have to feel the white guilt because I'm a person of color. Um, and yeah. And I don't have to suffer everything that a lot of people of color suffer because I can pass for white. Mm, so right. it's like, it, there's so many, depending on where you are and the context, race and identity is just so complicated. I, I have something you said struck me. Um, and I was maybe wondering if you guys could uh, speak to it since I've now spoken for all white people. Maybe you guys can speak <laughs> yeah. for all of your respective groups. Um, but you said something about how a, a guy said to you, you know, you're not really Latina because you're too like light skinned yeah, for not that. Mexican yeah, not, not Mexican enough. Not Mexican enough. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, that's a, a sentiment I've heard not often, but I hear every once in a while, but when it more when it comes to having the right belief system. Like I remember when Kanye West came out with his MAGA hat, it was I saw a lot of people on Twitter going like, Oh, well, he's not black anymore, essentially. And, right. and it yeah. seems like like Clarence Thomas isn't, you know, is is by some people like not considered black because it almost seems to be more of a uh point of view and perspective thing that like make, makes you not this mm-hmm. not oh, yeah. this group as opposed to the skin color. And I'm wondering like is it both? Is that, I mean, are, are both equally prevalent or is mm-hmm. like the thing about the skin color a little, a little less so? I was just wondering what you guys had to say. Yeah, I mean, in a world where we're so connected to our identity, somebody who, who goes against the, the typical like stereotypes about how your race or gender should align with your politics is a mm-hmm. threat. Like that's, that feels threatening. Hmm. Like in Seattle, there's a, a woman, Melina White Cusack, who is black and queer and conservative. And she wrote an essay for the Evergrey that went gangbusters. Ooh, hey. and, and she's shown up all over the city because she's such a surprise. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, like, but in part, what people like her show is that it, it, it like, you don't, not everything needs to flow from your identity. There is nuance to your beliefs. We, we can, we can actually like tackle these ideas uh, apart from who we are in some mm-hmm. ways, but, but it is, it's difficult to people's sense of, no, we have to stick together. We have to fight our battles or we're going to lose. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Sort of trying to socially enforce the solidarity of, you know, of the race or the group so that we can defeat the the structures of oppression and so forth. But I bet you're right, though, Greg. I mean, there is um, there are a couple of dynamics to it. There's I mean, you know, the skin shade, I, I think I, I think in the black community and I think this is probably also true in the Latino um, Latino community, uh, you know, being fair skinned. <laughs> can in a way make you a little bit more suspect. I don't think that's generally true, but if you're darker skinned, then I, you know, I, there's, 
uh, perhaps a reasonable expectation that you might have fielded a little bit more of the negative consequences that can be seen of, as having come with that. But, you know, nobody's going to take your black card for, you know, for not being able to pass the paper bag test. Right. I mean, you know, like Sean King is, I presume, I, I, Sean King is black, you know, the Black Lives Matter activist and so forth, although there are a lot of conspiracy theories on the Internet saying that he's not black at all. So I, I, I don't know. But the point being that he's considered a black leader, he's super fair skinned, but, you know, he's ideologically and politically committed to what people mm. perceive as perceive as the, you know, the the kind of mainstream activist left uh, uh, worldview and how to go about seeking uh, uh, racial justice in America. But if you're a black conservative, you're much more likely to be seen as having kind of sold out black people or not really being black in an authentic way, regardless of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about that is that I think that that is a just a, a terrible way to look at people. Uh, mm -hmm. I do. And, you know, look, I'm I'm a black Republican. Um, I've never been a particularly partisan individual, and I have viewpoints that uh, I do consider myself conservative, but I do have a lot of sympathy with a lot of social justice sorts of perspectives, precisely because of the history, Monica, that you were illuminating early, uh, alluding to earlier in this country. I think that a history of inequity and injustice in the past has implications for the present and the future if they're not, you know, uh, if they're not forthrightly contended with and i think many problems haven't been adequately contended with in our society but i will say that there is something in the idea of like there is kind of a black experience that is somewhat generalizable out across history and across time in as much as i do feel like even though my american experience has been a terrific one i really have no complaints about my life as an american um but you know, I can point to people in my family and certainly in my extended family, my married family and the community that I live in and so forth. I live in South Central Los Angeles. I've lived in the Jordan Downs projects and Watts and so forth. And well, Monica, you heard me talk about this a bit, at, a bit at weave. I can point to the experiences of other, you know, black people who I can look at their present circumstances, whether it's, you know, poverty, lack of education, being treated a certain way, potentially by law enforcement or by the, you know, political establishment or what have you, and say that that is a reflection of this country's history. They are angry about their circumstances, and I'm angry about it too. Like as a black man, let's say, you know, I am I am angry about this. But the thing that that I try and get people to do is to take justifiable indignation at historical and social and structural circumstances and channel that into a more kind of moral conversation where we recognize the humanity of people with differing points of view, but try and challenge them on the substance of what it is they're saying. So if you've got a person who's saying, look, the criminal justice system is, is totally fair as it stands, you know, that doesn't necessarily make that person a racist or a bigot or willfully, willfully uh, ignorant. But it may be that that person is ignorant about something uh, with respect to how our system operates. If that's the case, you know, make the point on on the basis of the of, of the ideas and use your identity if it's relevant to the conversation. This is just my advice. Use your identity if it's relevant to the conversation to say, look, I mean, I'm not only am I a black person, but I've had X, Y, and Z experience. And it's caused me to see things this way. And I think because of that, I can speak to a certain certain reality and i'd like for you to consider that you know that's different than saying because i'm black you don't have a right to speak on this right i think it's you know it's a more moral way of engaging the conversation but i also think it's more a more effective way of engaging yeah. the conversation yeah it is but but i'll say like this is where i struggle a bit because mm -hmm. i'm i'm like you in that you know i'm a mm -hmm. journalist for a reason i tell stories right. i try to be fair mm -hmm. i try to listen i love being curious i mm -hmm. love discovering stuff um I'm not the kind of person that's going to be out there protesting yeah. unless things get really, really, you know what I mean? Like, that's <laughs> right. just who I am. Like, I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think about the fight mm -hmm. so much. Right? right. But I really appreciate that we have fighters yes. and I appreciate that anger and fear are the most mobilizing emotions. Mm -hmm. So, so while I personally, I don't relate to um, using and employing anger very well, mm -hmm. I see it happening. And I think it's an, it's a catalyst and an accelerant that we need. Mm. Even though it's messy, yeah, 
it can be real messy, right? <laughs> Even like take Me Too, for instance. Me Too has been by all measures like a needed movement, right? Has it been messy? Has it been fair at every instant? Has it like taken, you know, the time to really evaluate? No, <laughs> like sometimes mm. it just steamrolls people, <laughs> you know, mm. right. but, but it's, but it's, what if it just needs to be steamrolled? Mm-hmm. What if we just don't have the time to sit and have moral conversations about everything? Right. So I, I struggle with that. I can totally see that side. And I think where, where I come down is like, we need our fighters and we need our people having conversations and trying to build understanding. Mm. And you've got to have a mix of both and different like cocktails of what we're having in society probably require different mixes. I think right now we don't have enough of the mediators. Mm. I don't. Um, there's some, some things off balance, but thanks to having so many fighters, stuff's moving really fast. But again, <laughs> thanks to stuff moving really fast, lots of people are being left behind, um, being left behind, being told they're ignorant, being told they're evil. And that's not helping anybody. Like mm. we're not, you know what I mean? Like that's not, you play that out too long. That's not going to get us any work. Mm-hmm. Even Cut. if like a third of the country is really happy. Kind of going along with that, I, I have a question about the Evergrey, which I assume is uh, a reference to Seattle's weather. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, Some people thought it was like senior living. It's not. Because <laughs> well, the state is called the it's called the Evergreen State, right? Isn't that correct? It's a play on Evergreen. It is okay. a play on Evergreen. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, so you know, it's been my opinion for a little while now that a lot of the uh, underlying reasons for the mess of polarization in our country is that. You know, we we kind of view things through the national level. And if you look at how our government was set up, it was really supposed to take place really more at the local level. Like you would vote for your house rep and you would vote for your state legislature and they would pretty much take care of everything else. And that kind of kept the focus inwards. But now you were talking about, you know, teams earlier. Now everyone's eyes are kind of raised from their own plot of land to up to Washington. And they're all watching like this away game happen and so caring about like Senate races in Texas when they live in Idaho or something, because like that's what's best for the team. And from what I gather from looking at um, the Evergrey yesterday is that it's a very local um, yes. paper. And I've heard you talk about, you know, use words like belonging and feeling heard and rootedness. And it, and it seems to me that that kind of focus on locality can be a way to, you know, get past some of that, uh, you know, inherent or inherent animosity that can happen because you're, you're dealing with people on a personal level within your own community and you're really sort of connected in that way. And I wonder if that was a conscious decision and if maybe you could speak to, you know, the effects of that. Yep. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> like the, the solution I see through all of this is all local. For all the reasons you mentioned, um, there was one time when I was struggling uh, with the Evergrey. I don't pr- remember the particular instance, but, you know, like I said, w- the Evergrey tries to set the table uh, for all perspectives. But Seattle's a very blue, blue, blue city. We get a lot of pressure to just ah, go ahead and just be very left, you know, because mm. that, that works here. Mm. Um, and I was struggling with, with one of those. And I was thinking about a Better Angels workshop. So I attended I've attended like every workshop that I can about conversations across divides. And one of them was a Better Angels one that came to Seattle. And nice. one big lesson that struck me from that workshop was at the very beginning, the facilitator said, by the way, like the workshops and the tips and tricks we're going to practice here are designed only for one to one conversations with someone with whom you have a relationship. Mm. And that to me was everything mm. right without relationship. Who the hell wants to put in the work and sweat and tears? <laughs> of getting through a really difficult disagreement or even bringing up something that feels really personal and identity driven and whatever. Nobody wants to do that. So what I realized was I I wrote in my notebook, I wrote, if nothing else, we're neighbors. Hmm. If you live in Seattle and you disagree with someone else who lives in Seattle, guess what? You share something. You, you are neighbors. Hmm. Like neighbor is this lovely way of asserting a relationship when people might not feel it. So the Evergrey is designed to make everyone belong and feel neighborly. Like we're mm. neighbors. So we have to deal with each other. Right. But, but there's that sense. If there isn't a relationship, who's going to do the work? Mm. So we, we have established a framework in which we're all neighbors because without that, without reading the Evergrey and feeling that connection to everyone else in the city, you can't build anything off of that. You can't actually get people to feel invested in each other's success. And that's true, healthy society. Holy cow. That was, that was. That was good. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and first of all, 
Yeah, thank you for that setup, Greg, because I I agree with the way you set it up, and Monica, I agree with the way you knocked it out. Um, relationship does have to be the foundation of any kind of uh, uh, a practice of patient sort of listening and empathy and understanding that can sort of, you know, bind us together and lead us down a road of actual fruitful collaboration in our politics, whether they be national or local, but the local context is really where you can kind of form those relationships one-to-one. And yet I do get the same sense, Greg, that the national conversation, not only is it sucking up all of our attention, but in doing so, it has a way of pulling us apart at every level because there's less room both for relationship building, but also for sort of the nuanced understanding perhaps of where people are coming from. And so there does become, I think, this question of how do you sort of reshift the national conversation in a way to where it's not as destructive, given the fact that I think we're up maybe always going to have a national conversation and more and more with social media and all the ways in which we are connected, uh, it, uh, all the ways in which geographical distance makes no difference. And Monica, you said that the Evergrey is designed to instill a sense of neighborliness yeah. and that, you know, being neighbors, it's a way of sort of making people feel connection when they otherwise not be might not be conscious of one, right? Exactly. And they might feel more uh, identity with, like you said, the away team, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> in Texas or D.C. or the battle or the whatever. And it's like, hey, dude, you're right here. Um, <laughs> I think that was you, Greg, but that was good. <laughs> yeah, th- this reminds me, like, years ago, uh, you know, I was working on, on sort of blogs and things, like, in the late aughts. Um, and I remember feeling kind of jealous of the Huffington Post because – God, like you see the top story and it's like 20,000 comments, right? And then somebody said, and I forget who it was, but they were like, 10,000 comments is not a conversation. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah exactly. Like, like that's the problem with the national conversation is mm-hmm. it's not. <laughs> it isn't one. Yeah. You cannot have a conversation at scale, mm-hmm. right? But media uh, on the internet has to operate at scale because there's no geographic constraints. And so mm. everyone's competing with everyone. Right. So uh, anyway, so yeah, like local media is where local conversation can really happen. Local media has been suffering horrible, horrible things. Mm. I'm trying to save local media. We'll see how that goes. But like, Dig. yeah, a national conversation isn't one when it happens online. Not right. really. Not unless people can build context where it can really, when people actually connect and listen and have that empathy. Do you think is the business model for the bigger national media organizations begins to crumble a little bit. Um, do you think that the sort of local journalism that you're doing is a path forward? Yes. Cool. <laughs> Absolutely. I, know, I broke the first rule. Don't ask yes or no questions, but <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's, I, I see a lot of signals that it's already happening and it, it has to do with there's frustration. There's sort of, sort of a throwing, throwing the towel. You know, I think there's, I think there's just more and more people going, Eh, <laughs> this big <laughs> stuff isn't helping anyone. Uh, partly because our our national identity is in tatters. Well, we, we, we don't it, know. and and that's what I wanted to speak to because you talked about you know this this local identity of at least being neighbors, being people who live in a community like Seattle or whatever the case may be, as being something that is it's thick enough to tie people together, even when other things may pull them apart, or even when there are other things putting distance between them. But one of the things we've been thinking about more and more, Better Angels, and talking about more and more, is the idea of trying to restore, you know, the sense of there being an American identity, which I think you rightfully say is sort of largely in tatters, right? And on the one hand, it's a daunting thing to try and do because the the American people are, we're so diverse, so many people in this country, and we are learning more and more about our own individual histories, I think, in ways that in some respects provide a greater amount of self-knowledge in terms of our own cultural group. I mean, we can even break down our genetic like composition down to the, you know, to the finite percentages and so forth now. But the tendency is for us to learn more and more about our sort of subgroup stories in a way that detracts from the idea that there even is a, a larger, you know, national or shared American story that right. we can that we can connect to one another on. And yeah. so, you know, it's increasingly part of our mission to try and restore some sense of that because even though and I think you're you're right to say that it is hard to have a conversation at scale and yet I think that it's a it's an existential threat to the country for us to be just a nation of subgroups, right? Yeah. 
and yep. not have some overarching kind of identity that binds us. So for me, you know, I feel like I talked to you, Monica. I talked to you, Greg. You know, Monica, you immigrated here as uh, as a young girl, Mexican, uh, but you know, Mexican American citizen. I, you know, biracial, uh, African American, white, and you know, um, with all sorts of other people in my family, for that matter. Greg, white guy. You know? <laughs> Greg, where are your where are your uh, people from? Uh, right I mean, because you're not you're not just Steinbrecher. That is not like a, a I know. English. Well, name, my mom you know? is like a Daughters of the Revolution. Okay. Like her her family's been here forever. My dad's family. I think maybe his great grandpa immigrated from Germany. So I'm like very like standard Western European, maybe a little bit of Italian just to spice it up a little bit, but that's, <laughs> but there's a story there though, you know, and my, oh, totally. my point is just that I feel like the thing that the three of us have in common, I think that the three of us would be very fascinated by one another's individual and family stories in all directions. Right. I think we, each of us could take a lot of value in knowing where the other one came from and that there are things that things about ourselves and the way we look at life in this present moment that would probably become you know, more clear to us if we knew more about each other's respective backgrounds. And there's some joy in learning about one another in that way, right? But the beauty of being an American for me is that knowing you know, a bit more about your background, Monica, and your background, Greg, kind of completes the picture a little bit more in terms of who I am as an American, right? Because at the end of the day, the beauty of what this country is supposed to be is that it's not fundamentally about blood and soil. But we all bring blood and soil to the experience in some mm. in some respect, mm. right? Um, but rather that, you know, this is supposed to be a, a nation of ideas and ideals, for, you know, mm. fundamentally. And we always go back to the Declaration of Independence, you know, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think beyond that, you know, the idea of freedom in a civil society brings with it the implication that we have an obligation to kind of protect that freedom by nurturing our relationships with one another. In other words, like you can't have, you can't be a self-governing people in the way that the founders intended. If there's not some basic respect that exists between, you know, members of this country. And that implies and free speech implies free speech implies a willingness to listen. It implies a willingness to learn. Right. And, you know, I, I feel like the conversation we're having here, therefore, is a very American conversation yeah. because, you know, we're not trying to we're we're trying to be open and honest about where it is we're coming to this conversation from while not prejudicing, you know, sort of where it is this conversation needs to go to in terms of political or ideological, you know, finishing points. It's it's more about saying, like, this is the process of our making a more perfect union. Is having yeah. this dialogue and being clear about, you know, who we are, but within that, you know, recognizing that who we are together is kind of, you know, we are, we're, we're committed uh, to preserving, you know, the, the freedom that allows us to have these conversations in the first place and nurturing our connections to one another as a way of doing it, you know? Yep, and, uh, totally. you know, I just, I feel like, it ought to be possible for us and, and our generation, maybe we're all about the same age here. You know, I feel like we're kind of coming to this point where I feel like a lot of folks who are older than us in politics and in media might be rooted in certain kind of frameworks for looking and talking about political and social issues that are a little bit, you know, sort of, I, I guess, pegged to the sensitivities of the past, whether you're, you know, a, a left wing person who is who feels like I oh got what am I trying to say? Unless you're a left wing person who feels as if, you know, we need to have a certain amount of sensitivity to people's pre existing kinds of biographies or white wing person who feels like we should brook no compromise in terms of allowing everybody to speak exactly the same way in exactly the same circumstances and so forth. But I think that we're placed in a, a way to where we can kind of try and preserve what's vital in the heritage of American idealism while also having enough sensitivity to the diversity of experience to be able to pay respect to that at the same time, you know? Yep. Yep. And um, that's, yep. that's just what I want to do, you know? So, yeah. So. And can I, can I tell you why I love America? Please do. Please do. <laughs> tell me why you love America. Here's why I love America. Okay. Mm. 
Um, and here's why this this period of time that we're going through that's so hard and painful and fearful is actually kind of awesome. Um, we as a country are trying to create uh, unity with the most diverse and free population that there is. Mm. We are trying to create community and at the same time value individual liberty. Right. You know, which means which means if you want to live your life this way, honey, that's fine. Or sweetie, if you want to go do that, that's great too. You know, parents to their kids. There's a generational like narrative of freedom. And we're trying to do it too with like a rainbow of different kinds of people <laughs> who come from different kinds of places. Right. Like, you know, and and so I would cut us a ton of slack because there's a lot of other places where people are more uniform. And and that's that's the most that's the part of community people don't want to talk about. Community is easier when you're more alike. Yeah, Community yeah absolutely. When you're more different. That's just the way it is, right? So people who are trying to build, they're trying to force community into America based on who they are, aren't seeing America, mm. right? America's too different. Mm. But, 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 you know, th- there's also kind of like the flip side. And, and if you're trying to just create a nation of tribes or, or tribe is, is a problematic term uh, for some folks. So like a nation of, of squads or teams, mm-hmm. Um, you know, then, then there's no America. (laughs) So, so that's our big challenge. And what I love about this country is that we're, we're doing it. Like we're, we're facing the challenge. We're taking it on. It doesn't have to be easy. It's not going to be like spoiler alert, bitter angels. Like you're you're, you're (laughs) all going to be successful in the next six months. You know what I mean? Like, like the vision is there and it's solid, Mm -hmm. but there's also like with any conflict resolution, like with any parents struggling with their teenager, there's resentment. There's anger and it's good. Right. It's useful. Like, and the reason we don't have a national identity and the reason it's in tatters is because it should be. Mm. Is because these squads and these teams have stood up. They have found a better, better, bigger voice. They're mm. finding their impact. They're finding their traction. And they're going to make America better by beating it up a little bit. You know <laughs> what I mean? So we cannot have America come back together tomorrow. We yeah. cannot do it. We need more time. We need more time for everyone to be angry and resentful and an angry, you know, teenager sometimes and a righteous, you know, blah, some other times and like a totally reasonable moral conversationalist and intellectual some other times. Mm, yeah. <laughs> but like, it's just, we need the ugly. Yeah. That's, that's my hope is we need the, it's the only way America can solve this problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if we do it, that's it. Like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty awesome. I'm speechless. That was so good. I, I could like, not was, agree with that more. But, yeah. I, um. One hundred percent. I felt the same way after listening to Monica speak at Weave. By the way, that's why we had to get her on the mic. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, well, I-, I can't add anything better than that. We are at an hour, Monica, and oh. this has been a fantastic conversation. And uh, don't at all be surprised if we immediately try and rope you into these conversations uh, every now and again from now on, because uh, you know cool. the, the perspective you bring is um, you know one that we need and one that I think uh, we're inspired by. So. Absolutely. This was great. It went really quickly. All right. Better Angels podcast. Thank you everybody for listening. Greg, do you want to give the folks some information about how they can uh, support the podcast? Absolutely. So uh, if you want to support this podcast, if you think it's worthwhile, um, the best way to get the word out is to get the word out by talking to people, texting people, emailing them, maybe sending them a, a message, sharing it. Um, but also it would help us out in the algorithm and the vast biasma of podcasts that are out there to sort of rise to the top if you rate the podcast especially if you write a review of the podcast um you know the better the review the better the rating as as possible please um although we also want your honest opinion so that you know the podcast can continue to improve so please that's right if you hate us let us know that too if you love us let but maybe us know via that. email if you hate us like and if you really <laughs> like us maybe put that in the review yeah for all hate mail to greg steinbrecher <laughs> meantime help us have this conversation scale all right folks let's go out there and depolarize america let's do it peace